did life come to be on planet Earth? Was it, as is commonly believed, that the primordial oceans and lightning-shattered skies gave birth to biomolecules, which then coalesced into primitive cells and the first replicating life forms? Or was the early Earth seeded by biomolecules and hardy, single-celled life forms from outer space? The first question addresses the mystery of abiogenesis, how life arose from non-living matter. The second question addresses the possibility of panspermia, which is a unique and interesting hypothesis about the spread of microorganisms and biomolecules throughout the galaxy. Panspermia is an interesting, kind of provocative hypothesis that could suggest how the first biomolecules came to Earth, or how very, very tiny single-celled organisms might have been seeded here. If we see very tiny fossils in the fossil record, we could think that these might be an indigenous life form, or it could be some kind of transplanted life form that seeded life here on Earth. It's really actually kind of difficult to tell what happened. This is a mystery that's just shrouded in the deep, heavy fog of time. The idea of life carried on asteroids through deep space and seeding planets with life is not a new idea. As much as 2,500 years ago, pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece, like Anaxagoras, pondered about the cosmos. Anaxagoras thought about eclipses and the sun and meteors and made comment about the possibility of life spreading from world to world through passage on comets or arcing pieces of the sun. He didn't have a scientifically accurate understanding of the sun. He thought it was like a hot stone or a piece of metal burning from the speed of its rotation, as were all of the stars. However, his idea of panspermia, however rough it happened to be, uh, it persisted, and it was refined during the 19th century by naturalists like Johns Jacob Berzelius and Hermann von Helmholtz, and it was shaped into a formal scientific hypothesis in the early 20th century by the Swedish chemist you might have heard of named Savante Arrhenius. Arrhenius was a famous chemist who made a lot of really important contributions to the developing field of physical chemistry. If you're a chemistry student, you almost certainly will recognize his name from the Arrhenius equation, which calculates temperature from the rate of reaction, or the Arrhenius definition of an acid as something that produces hydrogen ions when dissolving in a solution, and a base as something that produces hydroxide ions when it's dissolving in a solution. Arrhenius was a really smart kid. I mean, he taught himself to read at age three. And his side interests, his hobbies, included studying geology and astronomy. He was interested in the sun and comets, and in the course of his more recreational writing, he formulated ideas about life moving between planets in the form of spores. He fleshed out these ideas and published them in a book in 1908, titled Worlds in the Making, The Evolution of the Universe. In 1903, Arrhenius published an article called The Distribution of Life in Space, where he argued that microorganisms up to 1.5 micrometers in size could hypothetically be propelled through space by the radiation pressure from nearby stars. Now, 1.5 micrometers is an immensely tiny size, even for cells. 1.5 micrometers is the size of a small bacterium, which itself is usually a hundred times smaller than a typical eukaryotic animal cell. Arrhenius was also kind of obsessed with radiation pressure as an explanation for things, as he thought it was the source of the solar corona, the aurora, zodiacal light, and even comets. Anyways, this hypothesis that radiation pressure could propel microbes through space became known as radiopanspermia. Unfortunately for its proponents, it's not entirely feasible. High-energy radiation like x-rays and UV wavelengths will ionize and kill little microbes. Various experiments have been conducted in the microgravity of Earth orbit, like the European Space Agency's Biopan and ERA experiments, which showed that exposure to vacuum was by itself enough to kill most microbes. Exposure to UV radiation was extremely destructive to DNA, and it led to massive death in the microbe populations. But it's not all death in space. 
These experiments also found that exposure to the vacuum of space was much more survivable if the microbes were organized in clumps or groups, where outer layers of microbes could die and become crude shields for radiation, protecting the living microbes deeper within the conglomeration. Various microbes, and even plant seeds, can also survive for years in the vacuum of space, as long as they are protected from high-energy radiation by rock or ice. This natural shielding from high-energy radiation requires about one meter of ice and a half meter of rock in order to provide sufficient protection. Clearly, this is a lot larger than the 1.5 micrometers of Arrhenius's radiopanspermia hypothesis. Radiation pressure would also propel microbes slowly, taking them many hundreds or thousands of years to travel between planets in a single solar system. It would take many thousands or millions, possibly even billions of years for them to travel between star systems. The radiation would almost certainly kill them all during these huge expanses of time. So, radiopanspermia may not be that feasible, but what about the rock and ice that I mentioned? These materials can protect microbes indefinitely, so perhaps rocks are the vessels that can transport life through the cosmos. This is the lithopanspermia hypothesis. There are several steps in the lithopanspermia process that would, theoretically, allow life to spread between worlds. The first step involves the microbes and their protective ice rock being propelled on some trajectory towards another world, with such velocity that it can escape any local gravity wells and begin moving through interplanetary or interstellar space. The forces required for this to happen are literally astronomical, like the impact force of a meteor that blasts rock out into space. These impacts involve extreme factors, like a rapid temperature increase as the mechanical impact force burns away into heat, and a rapid acceleration as the previous static rock is suddenly blasted out of the atmosphere at escape velocities. It's pretty crazy, but experiments have shown that microbes can actually survive these forces. They can survive the intense changes in pressure the massive acceleration and jerk forces, and the extreme heat that can reach up to a thousand Kelvin. So if microbes can survive this insane explosion of forces, can they survive the next step in the lithopanspermia process? Because the rock is just calmly floating through space, it might seem like it's no big deal for the microbes. These conditions are seemingly a lot less stressful than the impact forces, but this is an illusion. They're still very rough. The microbes need to be protected by the rock, such that they can survive for hundreds, or thousands, or millions, or maybe billions of years deep in space. The distances involved are tremendous, so the travel times are also tremendous. The last step in the lithopanspermia process involves the microbe-laden rock entering the atmosphere of a new planet. The rock becomes a meteor, and it heats up from the immense friction caused by flying through an atmosphere at astronomical speeds. Its velocity is rapidly slowed down, and its temperature shoots up, with the incoming face of the meteor receiving the blunt of the friction and the heat. Because of this, the incoming face of the meteor is typically blasted apart or ablated, and any microbes embedded in the rock on this side get vaporized. However, the microbes on the cold side of the meteor, uh, so to speak, and those embedded deeper in the rock, have been shown in experiments to indeed be able to survive the impact with the atmosphere, and the subsequent impact with the crust. So, radiopanspermia may be implausible, but lithopanspermia is entirely feasible. The critical detail here with lithopanspermia has to do with the odds of impact. You see, space is big. As Douglas Adams said, it's really big. There's a lot of stuff out there, but there's a whole lot more of nothing. Asteroids and planets and stars are flying around in this big empty space, and occasionally they hit one another. In the statistically rare chance that a meteor strikes a planet, there's a small chance that some of the debris will be flung into space. 
there's a small chance that some of this debris will have life forms on it that can survive these impact forces. There's a small chance that some of this debris will make it out of the gravity well of its local planet or star system and spend some undetermined amount of time floating through space. There's a small chance that this floating asteroid will land on another planet. And there's a small chance that any microbes on that rock will survive re-entry and seed the new planet with life. As you probably noticed, that's a lot of small chances all happening in sequential order. It's rather difficult, if not impossible, to calculate the exact probabilities of, uh, of all of these chances. But the important thing to understand is that each event is relatively unlikely and it's compounded further by the unlikeliness of the subsequent event. So even though lithopanspermia is technically feasible, it, it's entirely within the realm of physical possibility, it's a remarkable statistical improbability. But there's another panspermia hypothesis that doesn't require this string of unlikely events. This hypothesis is actually really straightforward and relatively simple, and it's supported by a lot of evidence. And uh, just like the uh, lithopanspermia hypothesis, it's entirely feasible. It's 100% within the realm of physical possibility. This is called pseudopanspermia, because even though it involves life seeding a planet from outer space, there isn't necessarily a planet of origin. The seeds of life literally come from outer space itself. So how does this work? When a star system is forming, the early protoplanets are surrounded by a massive cloud of dust and gas. The basic gist of it is that ionizing radiation from the nearby star, or cosmic rays from more distant stars, can ionize carbon atoms or carbon-containing molecules and give them a charge, which makes them more reactive and attractive to oppositely charged particles. It basically encourages chemical reactions. The studies supporting this pseudopanspermia hypothesis are really interesting. In 2008, a study of the Murchison meteorite found that it contained the RNA nucleotide base uracil and the purine chemical xanthine, which is strongly indicative that these molecules were formed off of Earth in deep space. In 2009, NASA identified the amino acid glycine in a comet. In 2011, it was found that cosmic dust surrounding protostars and protoplanets, and in the space between solar systems, contains, and I quote, amorphous organic solids with a mixed aromatic aliphatic structure, unquote. In 2012, the organic molecule glycol aldehyde was identified in a dust cloud surrounding a distant star. That's exciting because glycol aldehyde is involved in the genesis of RNA, which is widely believed to be a more primitive precursor to DNA. Later that same year, NASA reported that clumps of carbon atoms, called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, can be made to rapidly react and form more complex organic chemicals when they're exposed to the radiation-filled environment of interstellar space. These increasingly complex organic chemicals are the base precursors to biomolecules like DNA and proteins. The experimental data keeps coming in. In 2013, researchers found precursors to the nucleotide base adenine and the amino acid alanine embedded in ice particles in deep space. In 2014, NASA estimated that 20% of the carbon in the universe might be incorporated into the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are found in clouds near protostars and protoplanets. Then, in 2015, NASA experiments found that uracil, thymine, and cytosine, all nucleotide bases in DNA and RNA, could be formed in outer space environments from precursor molecules known to exist in dust clouds or on comets and meteors. So the evidence suggests that organic molecules can be generated in outer space as clumps of carbon get ionized and made reactive from exposure to radiation. And that protoplanets are basically swimming in these organic-rich clouds as they orbit their stars. The organic chemicals naturally get sucked into the planet's gravity well, and they rain down in the atmosphere, coating the planet's crust with these chemical precursors for RNA, DNA, proteins, you name it. 
Given the right conditions, like a hospitable planetary climate and a suitable solvent, like liquid water, it's hypothesized that these precursor biomolecules can then undergo chemical evolution to produce self-replicating molecules, you know, RNA, DNA, and that this then leads to self-replicating cells. And bam, life exists. The planet was literally seeded by pseudopanspermia. Now, the radiopanspermia and the lithopanspermia hypotheses both address how life can be spread from planet to planet. But only pseudopanspermia proposes a potential explanation that tiptoes into the waters of abiogenesis, or the initial formation of life. Radio and lithopanspermia don't explain abiogenesis, not even partially. They only explain how already pre-existing life or pre-existing biomolecules could spread between worlds. Abiogenesis itself is a topic worthy of a whole different episode, all its own, so I won't go into too much detail on it here. There are other hypotheses for panspermia, but they're much more, how should I say, outlandish and fantastical. In 1960, the astronomy professor Thomas Gold hypothesized that billions of years ago, individuals from an advanced, spacefaring, alien civilization dumped their waste chemicals here on Earth. And Earth life originated from this. We're basically the descendants of alien trash. It's an interesting, if somewhat inglorious, explanation for life on Earth. Alternatively, it's been suggested that an alien civilization deliberately seeded the Earth with life, kind of like the engineers from the movie Prometheus. It can be hypothesized that, assuming an alien civilization exists in the first place, they might have what we call a probiotic value system, and this would encourage them to spread life. Uh, you know, it's probiotic, and so they would spread life by seeding other star systems and other planets with, uh, with organisms, with life. But keep in mind that these alien explanations for panspermia are clearly deep inside the realm of conjecture. It's not even a hypothesis. The radio, litho, and pseudopanspermia hypotheses are much more grounded in objective science. We still don't know for sure how life on Earth first got started. There are several competing ideas, which range from various explanations for earthly abiogenesis to the seeding of the planet from outer space, as explored by various panspermia hypotheses. One such hypothesis is that a, uh, an asteroid impact with Mars threw some Martian rock into our solar system, and it landed on Earth. And the idea is that this happened uh, many billions of years ago, back when Mars was slightly warmer, slightly wetter as it had a thicker atmosphere, and it could potentially have hosted life. If there was any microbial life on Mars at the time, it's theoretically possible that it could have survived in a rock blown off the Martian crust through some kind of asteroid impact. So what do you think? Did Earth life originate here on Earth? Or was our planet seeded billions of years ago by biochemicals from dust clouds? Or microbes carried on meteors? or, uh, perhaps stretching credulity a little bit, by some enigmatic alien civilization with the goal of spreading life throughout the cosmos.